Well, we get to continue on in the book of Romans, and it's an interesting part where we are. Tony had the privilege of reading the scriptures for us, and it's a tongue twister. And Paul's giving us a lot of theology here about why he's acting the way he's acting, why he's doing the things that he does. But in order for us to really grasp it, we need to kind of go back because we're looking at, again, more application between this understanding of the law and the gospel. We're going back and forth here. And what we're going to need to do since last week was more of an application, and the week before that we touched a little bit on context, we need to really just get refocused here before I start going down verse 13. If you were not here last week or if you've already forgotten, in fact, people say that by Tuesday most individuals forget about 70% of what was preached. That's why we put it up online so you get to hear it over and over and over again. Not really, but it's a good, good plug. But the law brings us to a place to understand sin. That's, that's, that's it. With the law, we understand sin. We know that grace is amazing. It is the most precious gem. It is the most valuable thing. It is the wonderful message in which we have. But when you take this gospel and you just kind of move it around, sometimes individuals don't really understand how precious it is. But when you take it and you put it in front of something black, like a black background, and it starts to shine, all of a sudden the contrast makes you aware that the gospel is indeed precious. Now the human heart is black, it's dark, but the gospel overcomes all of that. And so the reading and what we're getting into with this personal account from the Apostle Paul, he's making it clear. He really wants us to know through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the human condition is radically corrupt. Everything about us is corrupt from the word go. The human heart is just an absolute wickedness. And so everything we've been going through is showing us that we are not good. We can't be good. There's nothing in us that's good. And when the weight of the law, when the, the law reveals our motives, when it reveals how we are, who we are, we're able to see through this lens that we are absolutely rightly deserving of judgment. We went through that quite a bit last week, didn't we? We talked about the law being this perfect standard. In fact, Psalm 19 verse 7 tells us clearly that the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. And so we understand that no matter how long we've been a Christian, how long we have been searching, or maybe better yet, how long we have been religious, the law tells us that no matter how good we think we are, we are wrong. Everything we do, even in a converted state, we are wrestling with the back and forth, the flesh and the spirit. The flesh rises up all the time. It controls how we act, how we think, what we're doing in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, Jeremiah 17.9 makes it very clear, right? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The worst thing a Christian can ever tell you is, oh, just trust your heart. No, don't trust your heart. Trust the word of God. Now more so then, the law reveals our condition, though it reveals our condition, it doesn't do anything to remedy our condition. The law tells us that we have sin, but the law cannot save us from sin. The only salvation is justification by faith through grace in Christ alone. The commandment, therefore, the testimony of the law is right. That's why the law has been written in all of our consciences. It's written upon our hearts. And what happens during salvation, a heart that was once against God, that was once hard, the Holy Spirit brings this regeneration, this newness of life. And that will, which was in the bondage of sin and death and decay, has now been renewed. And therefore, that new renewed will is able to call upon God and cry out so that they can be saved. Because in that new will, the law has shown them that they were condemned. The law is the evidence of that depravity of mankind. It is the revealer of sin. As I mentioned, it is the sword that brings about that mortal wound. That wound that is on all of us. It is grace that comes and heals. 
This is why it says in 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That is not a prosperity physical healing verse. By his wounds you have been healed means your spiritual condition. The wound in which the law brings that mortal blow of the law, you are now healed because of what Christ did upon the cross. It's an interesting image I want to bring to you this morning. Now, I don't know if if you, again, I will say it often. Did you know Charles Spurgeon read Pilgrim's Progress over a hundred times in his life? I think I'm only on number seven. So if you have not read Pilgrim's Progress, pick it up, buy it, own it, read it. It is a wonderful book. If you don't like to read, listen to it. But in Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress, there is a conversation that takes place between Christian and faithful. And what faithful is doing, he is speaking to Christian about the law. He is speaking to what happened to him and the one who came to him to show him that he was indeed under the law. Now I'm going to read that portion, and it's in the older English, so bear with me. It's going to be hard to read, but let's just do it, because it says something amazing. Listen, quote, This is faithful talking to Christian. So soon as the man overtook me, he was but a word and a blow. For down he knocked me and laid me for dead. But when I was a little come to myself again, I asked him wherefore he served me so. He said, because of my secret inclining to Adam the first. And with that, he struck me another deadly blow on the breast and beat me down backwards. So I lay at his foot as dead as before. So when I came to myself again, I cried to him, mercy. But he said to me, I know not how to show mercy. And he knocked me down again. And he had doubtless made an end of me, but the one came by to him forbear. End quote. What is this saying? Well, faithful was showing what was happening. Faithful was showing, talking to Christian about the law. Blow after blow, faithful was dead and hopeless and in desperate need of one to come by. And as faithful was laying there in this this story of Pilgrim's Progress, he was down and dead under the law of Moses. And it required some another to come by his aid. It required one who could forbear on behalf of faithful. And as the story goes on, Christian says, who was it that bid him forbear? And then faithful answers, I did not know him at first. But as he went by, I perceived the holes in his hands and in his side, and I concluded that it was our Lord upon the hill. It was the Lord. And then Christian says, the man that overtook you was Moses. He spareth neither, knoweth he know how to show mercy to those who transgress the law. And faithful answers, oh, I know it very well. Now, many Christians have not had that encounter that faithful had. They have never known the law coming down and bearing blow upon blow upon blow so that they are left in only the rightful state which is death. But in Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan shows us that under the law we indeed are undone. And the law, therefore, is not sin, but the law reveals sin. It is the bad news in which makes the gospel the good news. You can't have good without bad. That is why last week, In our reading, Paul says that the law, the holy commandment, is holy and righteous and good. All of that brings us to where we are today, starting now in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So I'll read it as a reminder. I'll be reading from the ESV. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin. And through the commandment, might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Now we come to this question, right? Since the law is good, since it does that which is good, and it bring, how can it be something bad? If it's bringing forth death, how is this all working together? When you read the scriptures, you start to learn some things about theology. And it wasn't that the law was the sin. I keep saying it. You're like, Steve, you're repeating yourself. Absolutely. 
so it's embedded into our memories. It was our sin that brought about the death. Not the law. The law reveals we deserve death. The law is the image that we get because we must die because we have transgressed a holy God. Sin cannot be in his presence. Therefore, it is sin that brings about man's greatest misery. The Heidelberg teaches us that. We have this great misery. Our misery is sin. The reason why our lives sometimes are hard is because of sin. Sin shows us. We sin because we are depraved. Our corruption is all because of sin. And the law does rightly by showing us that condition. That's what Paul's dealing with. He's dealing with it over and again in different ways, in different forms, so it sinks into the believer. And again, Paul calls out this one statement, by no means. He keeps using these things, by no means, in the scripture. We have to ask, why does he say that? Why does Paul say by no means? Because he doesn't want us to misunderstand. He doesn't want the false accusations of those false teachers coming in and diluting the gospel. There's so many things I can talk about here, and it's hard, but I want us to think about the law in a sense. No, oh, that's going to be a bad one. Not the, think of sin as a rock, and you're making a brick. This will work. So you're making a brick, and if you know how to make bricks out of clay and straw, you realize that if there's anything impure inside that brick, it's not going to cure right. It's going to be all cracked, and it's going to be useless, right? So think of sin as a rock. And the clay is around that rock. You're making a brick. But you can see that there's something wrong. So you take water. And you start spraying away the clay from the rock. In a sense, that water from the hose is the law. And it, re it shows you and it reveals the sin, which is the rock. So as it's getting down, as things are being taken away, the, the water removes the clay so that sin is known, or the rock is, re is known. That's what the law does. Does that make sense? And so as the law is being sent, presented to you, which we did last week, we went through the Ten Commandments, it was washing away all of your excuses, it was washing away all of your opinions, it was washing away all of your education, and it got right down to that rock of sin in your life. That's the best way I could come up with it. And so this week's message, since it's Holy Scripture, ties in exactly to what Paul was saying last week, because it's the same letter, it's the same chapter. And therefore, we must understand what the law is doing. If you turn to Galatians chapter 3, that's a great book, Galatians chapter 3. It's after 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read verses 19 through 26, because it really helps us with where we need to go this morning. Again, Galatians 3, 19 through 26. I love the sound of pages of a Bible turning in a church. It's better than hearing our phones going off, that's for sure. Why then the law? It was added because of transgression until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediate, that's a hard word for me to say, intermediary. Now, that word I just said implies more than one, but God is one. Now listen carefully. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, the righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Now that ties in what we spoke about last week. The law being the guardian, shows us that we are in the family of God. But it also shows us that the law, excuse me, reveals our sin. This is a lot. So 
So if you're not saved here this morning, you're under the law. You're not under the guardian of Jesus Christ. You're not in the family of God. And therefore, the law is still doing its work in you by showing you that you need to come to salvation. Your testimony, your, or sorry, not your testimony, your confession, your conscience is stirring. And so basically where I'm trying to get at is the groundwork has been laid. The scripture is being perfectly clear here. Paul is tying it all together so when we get to verse 15, it's going to really hit home. And what that is, is all believers still sin. Those who have been justified by faith and those who have union with Christ will still sin. Look at verse 15 to 20. I'm going to try to do it again, Tony. Let's see if we can get through this. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know nothing good dwells within me. For I know that nothing Sorry, that it dwells in me, that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Are we not all there? Is this not your life? Is this not my life? This is so powerful, friends. It's reminding us that if this is what the Apostle Paul is dealing with in his walk with Jesus Christ, it's okay if we are going through this in our walk. The problem with these verses, they have been taken out of context so many times. So let me just do a little bit of background here and tell you what the verse is not, N-O-T, not saying. What this verse is not saying is, is talking about Paul before his regeneration. This is not about an unsaved Paul. He is not talking about who he was before he was saved. Not at all. This is also not, big, huge, N-O-T, not some kind of semi-Pelagian view that the Arminians hold to, some kind of Wesleyan theology that Paul's talking about the state of higher or lower perfection. That if we can get to this point of perfection in our lives that he's wrestling with. That's not what this scripture is getting at. It's not about maturity to no longer sin. And a big not... If I could stand up and scream it with a megaphone, this is not Paul saying, well, since we can't stop sinning, there's no point fighting sin. And since we're going to keep on sinning, we might as well live life to the fullest because after all, it's in our DNA and I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. No, that's not what it's saying. That's really bad. That's antinomian. So those things need to be put aside and we need to understand exactly what Paul is driving at here. Never forget the Apostle Paul is saved. He has been regenerated. That happened to him on the road to Damascus when he, in his free will, joke, but when the almighty God presented himself in front of Paul and he was blinded and thrown down and called out to the Lord. When the Lord took Saul and brought him from the bondage of sin to the bondage of newness of life, that man was saved. So there is no way that this verse is Paul talking about something unsaved. In fact, if you look at the language in verse 15, he says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. The root word here, masao, that's important. Because what the word is telling us, it is talking about a strong displeasure, a strong disliking, an intense disliking. I don't know about you, but when have you met an unconverted person that has an intense disliking over their sin? They might feel bad about it because they got caught in something, but there's not this strong disliking. Well, Paul here is saying he has a hatred for sin. And so we know the language that's being used by the apostle, he's not talking about this practice of sinning, but he's, that he just wants to continue to sin. He wants to be in the will of God. This is his desire. 
He's already stressed this. He has addressed that issue from chapters 1 all the way to chapter 3 in this letter. And so we start to see that there is something going on. His character, who he is. He's not an unsaved man. So what does this verse mean then? What do 15 moving down to verse 20, what is it all about? It's pretty straightforward, and I think it's quite easy if we look at it carefully. The saved individual desires to do what God commands. He runs to God, or she runs to God. We don't run to sin. The unregenerate individual runs to sin. That's how their mind thinks. Sin tastes good, I'm going to taste it. I want it. I'm going to fulfill it. That's why I'm doing it, because that's what I want. The biggest form of sin that we know in our lives is rebellion. This is what I want, when I want, how I want, and I'm going to get it. But that's not what a converted person does. Paul is saved. He is soundly saved. And he is saying that he hates the old nature. He hates that old Adam. And he understands it's only divine grace that keeps him there. And so he's examining and pulling out for us the struggle that he has to teach us how we overcome that struggle. It's beautiful. A saved individual can't be comfortable in sin, folks. We hate it. We do it. It drives us nuts. We call to God and we have to fight all these convictions and and worthlessness that the enemy throws at us when we mess up. You know what I'm talking about, right? You sin and the enemy's right there. It's like, hey, you worthless piece of garbage. I can't believe you did that. Man, why even even say it? Let's go to the liquor store. Get over it. You're such a hypocrite. That's what he does. But Paul understands divine grace keeps him. He understands divine grace keeps him. He's not comfortable there. That's why there's that tension in which we keep talking about in our lives. The individual understands the only remedy to their misery is grace. They understand their salvation is beautiful. So any sin that comes into their life is horrific. It is disgusting. It is putrid because it takes them and separates them in a way, because you can't lose your salvation, but it separates that sweet communion that they have with God himself. You know, David understood this. He did. When David sinned, he didn't blame other people. You know, his prayer wasn't, oh God, forgive me for my anger. Those maple leaves, they just, they keep losing. And I know I lost my anger at church, but that sister sitting beside me in that candy wrapper, you Lord, no. He doesn't do that, does he? When David was caught in sin, sleeping with Uriah's wife, thus, if you look at the story, breaking every single commandment, all ten in one shot, and when he was called out by Nathan, there's only one writing, one right response, excuse me, Psalm 53, verses 3 through 5. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified. In your words, and blameless in your judgment, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David took ownership for his sin. Because that's what converted people do. And this is what the scripture is bringing us to this morning as believers. We can make zero mistakes here. We do not mess with this. Hear me carefully if you hear anything this morning. You are either saved or you are not. That's it. There is no such thing as a halfway Christian. None. There is no such thing as carnal Christianity. You either are carnal or you are Christian. You are either just indulging in your sin or you're Romans 7, 15 through 20 and you are fighting those sins and you're finding yourself doing the things that you hate and even though you don't want to do them, you do them, but you run to Christ every single time because you know those things are gross and dirty and wrong and therefore you can't have comfort in them. So if you're here this morning like I'm a halfway Christian, dude, it's all grave for me. You're not saved. 
Simple. How dare you say that, Pastor Steve? Amen. Because the one who is redeemed fights sin. We sin, but we fight sin. We fight it with everything that we have. It's like a soldier. Think of a soldier for one of the movies you may have watched. I've watched every single war movie that's ever been made. I know them all. And some of the most horrific war scenes of any movie or documentary in real war, do you want to know what it was from? The Vietnam conflict. In World War II, an average soldier saw about 42 days worth of combat in their departure overseas. In Vietnam, they saw approximately 240. There were times where they were so overrun and a soldier is fighting, right? And they're firing their weapons. Of course, in Hollywood, right? They got two of them, right? But nonetheless, they're firing. Then they run out of ammo. Now they have their bayonets. Then they're fighting with their bare hands. Their knuckles are bloodied. They're tired. They're laying on the ground spent. That is how the Christian is supposed to be fighting sin. John Owen calls it mortification. Quote, do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. And the regenerate, regenerated person, the saved person, understands this. We might not be as mature as John Owen. We may struggle a lot more than our brother and sister sitting beside us. We can't look about how one brother might be sanctified compared to another sister, but we are all at least in the fight. We are a soldier. We understand we cannot be laying down and being comfortable in sin. Owen also says, quote, The axe is to be laid to the root of the tree. The deeds of the flesh are to be mortified in their causes from whence they spring. That's what a saved person does. Why does the saved person do that? Because sin is against God. And because we love God, we hate sin. Why would we want to go back to sin? Why do we want to continue to do the things we hate? This is what the Apostle Paul is driving at. We want to do the very good things we're called to do, but we can't. And when we do the bad things we shouldn't be doing, we hate it. There's an old nature versus new nature here, friends. It's this going back and forth. But the problem for many believers is we, we say that the old nature is stronger. I hear it so many times as a pastor. Why are you in that sin? Oh, you don't know how strong this sin's got to hold me, pastor. Why are you doing that? Oh, you don't know how strong this sin is in my life, Pastor. Now, in my mind, and I don't say it out loud, it's like, you know, it's like Marty McFly. It's like, hello, McFly. He rose from the dead. How much power can the old nature have over Jesus Christ? But of course, I don't say that because that would be very unpastorally of me. But do we not act like that? And we go back to that sin over and over again because we think the old nature is stronger than the new nature. But this verse also deals with another problem that we as Christians have. You know what that's about? Our own works. We do the things we don't want to do. We find ourselves and we do and we hate them. We go back and forth and so we find ourselves sinning. Yes, we know that's wrong. But then all of a sudden something kicks into the Christian. You know what that is? I keep sinning too much so I must work harder in order that I might be saved. I better go to church more. How many, you've all done it. We've all done it. You, you mess up. You sin. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm going to go to church more. I'm going to gamble less. I'm going to stop kicking the cat. I'm going to do all these things so you can love me and it's going to be good. And then two weeks later, you mess up again. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. You can't earn it. So the verse has kind of an absolute application on that. We don't hate sin because we don't want to go to hell. We hate sin because we love God. And we're not working for our salvation. We love him so much that we do these things and we fight sin because he is worthy. 
So we've traveled down all these verses since last week, verses 9, all the way down to 20. And if Paul was building a house, he has just pounded more nails into the, the drywall board, as it were. So we can understand very clearly from this point in the sermon that there are two realities. There's the flesh and there's the spirit. So, here's something. Because we have these two natures that we have to deal with, did you know that even in our worship and in our prayers, there is sin? Did you know that everything in your life as a Christian is stained in sin? It's true. Everything. Because Adam still exists. You are still in the flesh, even though you are in the spirit. So even in your best work that you could ever do, even in the most righteous deeds that you could come up with, even if you think you're the John Q or Sally Q Christian, and you should have your picture up on the lobby for the Christian of the month, you know, and have everybody praise you for your awesomeness, it's still sin in God's eyes. That's why grace is amazing. That is why it is precious. That is why it's a gift. Because we can simply just surrender ourselves at the feet of Christ and say, Lord, you know I am a wretch. And you know the things I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing. And I hate doing them, Lord. But there's nothing good in me but you, O Lord, are worthy. I have no worth, but my worth is in you, O Lord. Therefore, take me, use me, strip me, guide me, build me, do whatever you want with this vessel of clay. You alone deserve to be praised. I bring nothing to this. And when Christians get to that point, they are able to start walking in more maturity. Louis Burkhoff, my favorite systematic theologian for sure, says, grace is the free bestowal of kindness on one, ready for it, who has no claim to it. Love that. So let's keep going. We have a few more verses we have to tackle this morning. Verses 21 to 25. And you know we're going past that, just so you know. We're not stopping at verse 25, just in case there's some people who really know their Bibles and go, I wonder if the pastor knows that chapter 8 actually bleeds into chapter. We're, we're, we're good. 21 and 25. So I find it to be the law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members, another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells within my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Isn't that amazing? As I said in the beginning, we can resonate with the Apostle Paul here, can we not? This sinful nature that we're bound in. I don't know about you, but a lot of my prayers are like that. It's like, oh, if I could just be delivered. Lord, I look forward to death. Don't get me wrong, I'm not suicidal. But a lot of people who are not saved think Christians are suicidal, right? It's like, man, I can't wait till I die, man. They're like, dude, you got so much to live for. It's like, I can't wait, man. I hope maybe today is the day I get struck with lightning. I'm before the Lord. And they're like, man, you're suicidal. No, 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 no. We know that through the death, we will be released from this wretched vessel, this filthy flesh, and we'll never sin ever again. We know that when the Lord makes all things new, we'll be glorified in his presence without the ability. So we're not suicidal, we're just kingdom focused. But we are indeed bound in this vessel. So what does, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this issue of this, oh, what a wretched man that I am? Well, first and foremost, if there's anybody here that you think you're super awesome and righteous, We all can look at this verse and go, well, if the Apostle Paul's crying out, what a wretched man that I am, I think we should all be slow to think that we're not wretched. Proverbs 4.17 speaks of our humanity quite quickly. For they eat bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. This is what we've been dealing with. If we're saved, we shouldn't be eating the bread of the wickedness, right? We shouldn't be rejoicing in that. We should be fighting it. Psalm 119.16 says, But a man of God, a woman of God, one who has been regenerated, says, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The first is the unregenerate. The second is the saved. In fact, going out over to verse 47, it goes even further. For I find delight in your commandment, which I love. 
So we're dealing with Adam the first, and we're dealing with regeneration. Adam's that old nature, that old corrupt, salty dog, that old depraved flesh. You know what Adam likes? Or for you sisters, let's go Eve, even though it's not really theologically correct. You know, you know, what, you know what they like? Rebellion. That's what the wretched man that I am, the wretched nature of the flesh, Adam loves rebellion. He delights in rebellion. He delights in falsehood. This is why the pastors and the elders are called to deal with gossip and slander and lack of submission to God's word. This is why there's rules and rules of order and rules of worship when we come into a church. It's not because people are on power tripping. It's because Adam is a filthy creature. And he always likes to poke his head right at the right time. So how do we deal with that? Well, we admit, as I've already said, that we're going to struggle. We're going to fight. We're going to hold on. We're going to remember that we're not better than the next person beside us. You know, one of the hardest things for Christians, and I've dealt with this as an elder or as a pastor from, from some churches, and maybe you know somebody like this. When somebody says, you know, I've been saved for 20 years, I'm doing all right. I used to be a sinner like you, but uh, son, I've been walking with the Lord for 40 years. I don't struggle with those sins anymore. That's the saddest thing. Because the reality is for the Christian, the longer they've walked with the Lord, they know they're more wretched than they were 20 years ago. They know how to stay. You meet a true believer who understands doctrine, who's walked with the Lord for 60 years, he will preach more on how he should be rightly condemned to hell than how awesome he is. Because the scriptures reveal how wonderful and amazing God is. And we contrast that. And the more we know about God, the more we know about ourselves. That's, we call it sanctification. Luther said it best, I'm more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. Paul resonates here then. We can all see it that we're wretched. We're in a body of sin. We're in this vessel, this container of wickedness. Who is going to free us? How can we be free? How? The gospel. Amen. The Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. The one who comes and though we are sinners, he died for us. Though we hate God, he loved us and sent his son to be that propitiation for our sin so that we can be reconciled to God. It is all Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul is getting at. He is reminding us of the very nature of who we are. Yes, we're going to continue to do things that we shouldn't do. Yes, sin is going to keep on rising up in our hearts and causing all kinds of problems. But sin will not conquer because Jesus Christ conquered. He has been resurrected. And because he has been resurrected, we too will be resurrected to new life. The old nature will be dead. We can look forward. We can hang in there. We will make it. That is the whole point. All praise, all glory is to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yes, we're justified. Absolutely. But verse 25, as we get into it, points to the reality that our only hope is pure grace. It's our only hope. Christianity is not about information. The information we get is transformation. That's what grace does. It's a maturing. It causes us to be free. I'm almost done. Hang in there. So to close the first time, I see people getting it. Yeah, I, you can see it all, guys, up here. You really can. It's kind of like, and it's like this one. I, this is my favorite. <laughs> There's a clock right on the wall. Just look at it. It makes it easier. But what we learn is though we do the things we no longer want to do, though sin dwells within us, we know nothing is good in our flesh. Though we desire to do what is right, but we don't have the ability to carry it out. And though we desire 
to live a godly life, we learn and accept that sin will pop its ugly head up in our life time and time again. But those sins that we do and that we think disqualify us or would cause God not to love us, those sins were nailed to the cross. They are done. They have been crucified with Christ. And that is exactly what Romans 6, 6 was all about. When we were back in that chapter and verse, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We do have victory. We are called to fight. The Christian can do this. It's wonderful. So let's go back to Pilgrim for a sec, uh, Christian and Pilgrim's progress for a second. Because he understood this when he went to the place of deliverance. And the book tells us, quote, At this time, Christian felt glad and overjoyed. And in his excitement, he exclaimed, He has given me rest by the means of his sorrow and life by the means of his death. Praise God. That's how we work through this. We understand there's these two natures of God and of filthy sin. And if you profess Christ, it should at least be like this. Faith in Christ, sin, uh, you know what I'm saying? Sin comes in, bang, it comes back down. It doesn't overpower you. Why? We pursue holiness. And when those evil things surface, we don't take pleasure in them. We don't. I hate my sin, guys. I know you do too. At least some of you do. I'm being fair. Some people don't. They say they do until the lights are off and it's 2 o'clock in the morning and their internet's turned on, but then they turn out that they love sin more than Christ. I'm just saying. That's not in my notes. The conscience screams to you as a believer. Don't do it. Every time. Let's just, this is not my notes, but I realize I've already gone over, so I'm just going to keep going. But, in your mind, I do not answer out loud. I want you to think about how you blew it. Maybe today, yesterday, or Friday. Okay, we're all sinners here, so just think of that one sin. And ask yourself... Did God just leave you to jump into it? Or can you actually think just before it happened, don't do it. I bet you there's not one believer here that didn't hear that warning bell. Oh, I know it's wrong. But it just tastes so good. This is what Paul's driving at. You don't enjoy sin. You hate it. Stop doing it. So we need to respond and we need to get out of here this morning so you all don't egg my car. How do we as Christians then carry this out? Well, the first thing we do is we realize that sin was defeated at the cross just like death was. And we're not called to keep on sinning, but we have to live a life with the tension in which we spoke about four weeks ago. That's how you deal with this. Your your plumb line is that tension in your life. Are we truly fighting sin in our life? And when you do sin, I want to say this. Do you kick yourself? Do you beat yourself up over the head? Are you like one of those Catholics that want to whip yourself in the back? Do we wail? Do we accuse God from walking away from us? Do we sit in our misery that we're no longer lovable? Because this is the other way how you deal with what Paul's teaching this morning. If you hate what you're doing in your sin, it already shows that you're okay. Is that, right? Is that fair to say, Tony? That's a good elder statement. We should put that on a website. If you hate your sin, you know you're, doing, you're okay. But, if the enemy wants to keep on kicking you in the teeth and calling you the most worthless piece of flesh that has ever lived, because you can't get yourself together? Listen to what else Paul says here in his letter by looking at chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 
Jesus Christ accomplished what the law could not do. Brothers and sisters, you are free. And we know the scripture tells us clearly in John 8, 36, that he who is free is free indeed. And that freedom is not dependent upon your obedience to the holy law, but it's completely upon his obedience to the holy law, that he fulfilled it so that we can be redeemed. And in that, since he fulfilled it, he preserves each and every one who is his elect through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to keep us in his grip to the very end. We do not serve a shepherd who cannot keep his sheep. We have the great and wonderful shepherd, the good shepherd, who says in John 10, 38, what? That I give them eternal life. You didn't give it to yourself. He did. I give them eternal life. Hold on to that. Because they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one, and that includes you. You can't slip out, jump out, fall out. Somebody can't pull you out. And that is why Paul can say the reality in Philippians 1, 6, that I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's all about the final judgment. So if you're worried about the final judgment and you're worried that you keep on sinning, you have no conscience, you just keep on going, let me tell you, it can be ratified today. It can be reconciled today in Jesus Christ. Condemnation. What a beautiful, beautiful promise. This takarima. It's a legal statement. It's done. To be condemned by a judge, to be condemned by a king. Everything that you have done is gone. And because it is gone, you have been justified. And not only is it gone, but you have a great mediator, Jesus Christ. That is why we talked about union two weeks ago and three weeks ago. This is why we addressed it in Romans 6, 23. Yes, indeed, the wages of sin is death. But... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you see the beautiful thing here? Do you see why we can hate sin? Do you see why when we mess up and why Paul's saying when he does what he does and does it, you know it by now, going back and forth with this internal internal struggle? For the Christian, we know we have hope. Our sins were imputed upon Christ. Never forget the doctrine of double imputation. Our sins were on Christ. He paid for them. The one you did five minutes before walking to church, and for some of you, the one you did when you thought something about me. I'm just saying, just kidding. But he paid for it. The one you're about to do when you leave here, he has already taken that. He bore the wrath of God. All of it. Every single drop of wrath. He became the curse. What happened to us? His righteousness was what? Onto us. That's why we're regarded as justified by faith through the finished work and obedience of Christ the Son. That is why Paul can say, I do the things I hate. When I want to do good, I find myself doing the things that repulse me. Because the believer knows that it is the most foul stench. It is the most disgusting thing a sinner, a person can do. It's like the man who's about to go down the aisle to his pure, beautiful bride veiled in white and decides to go to the left and visit a prostitute. Because that's how disgusting sin is. And perhaps you never looked at it like this before. But when you do, you will start walking in that newness of life. You will start having victory over your sin. You will start obeying Holy Scripture. You will start disciplining your flesh and that Adamic nature because you trust 
Jesus Christ, to whom the Scriptures testify, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he sustains us to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 